By this point, it's common knowledge for support characters to have far more equity in standings and placements among the overwhelming majority of players' tier lists for a multitude of reasons, key of which being their range of use cases far eclipsing that of their damage-dealing counterparts. As I'm sure you're well aware by now, the value of a character is determined by not only their practical performance, but other ancillary factors that are just as, if not more, paramount, including, but not limited to, elements such as team versatility, ease of use, and coverage, of which those are far more present on supports and off-fielders than that of on-fielders, which is why even as early as the start of version 3, you'd be hard-pressed to consider any character who is exclusively on-field as quote-unquote S-tier due to the very limitations imposed on those who can't exert pressure without being the active party member. That only made it more surprising when Alhaitham was almost immediately instated as one of the best characters in the entire game, where he has remained ever since, and there are no signs of him losing market share. Well into version 4 now, and Alhaitham still remains one of the most popular and high-performing damage dealers in Genshin, consistently ranking among the top 20 characters for Spiral Abyss, and a well-known favorite among hardcore and casual players the world over for just about any scenario in the overworld. So for today's episode of Why Everyone Plays, we'll investigate exactly what about Alhaitham has enabled him to have one of the most consistently impressive resumes for a DPS character. Before getting started, I want to ask everyone if you're in the market for a phone strong enough to run Genshin and Star Rail, then I have a suggestion for you. Check out the new Red Magic 9 Pro, the newest release of the Red Magic phone line. Red Magic is a professional gaming equipment brand that's all about pushing top-notch gaming devices from monitors to keyboards, mice, and of course, phones. The Red Magic 9 Pro is a mobile device optimized for gaming with the latest cutting-edge parts including, but not limited to, the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 processor, up to 16 gigs of DDR5 RAM, half a terabyte of UFS 4.0 storage, one of the best battery capacities I've seen, a screen with 120 refresh rate, and an instant touch sample rate of 2000Hz for perfect controls. It is pretty much everything you can ask for in next-gen phones. There are honestly too many features to go over from hardware to software, but the basic gist is that this phone is very, very robust in performance. Being made specifically for gaming, they have a plethora of gaming-related stuff for you to enjoy. First and foremost being the game space. By flipping the switch on the side of your phone, it puts the phone into a gaming mode and pulls up a library of all your games, including a list of settings for you to play with. They even include a library of plugins for you to take advantage of. I know Genshin can be kind of hard to handle on mobile, but Red Magic took this into account by increasing the response rate, precision, and sensitivity of the screen, in addition to shoulder triggers built into the phone itself, giving you two more buttons to use, which, in my case, I made it so the shoulder buttons rotate the screen for me, so you can have a better gameplay experience. If you're interested in copying a new gaming phone for yourself, then definitely check out Red Magic using my link on screen or in the description. I'm honestly impressed at how much they put into this thing while keeping it sleek and flat at the same time. Thanks again to Red Magic for sponsoring my channel, but for now, back to the video. The year of Sumeru was a critical turning point for Genshin. Now that the cast of available characters has expanded considerably and each element has at least one or two units that stand among the top, there's a rising increase in concern for efficiency in relation to members of a similar job, understandably. Back in the day when there were only a handful of units who could do X, Y, or Z job, though competition was present, it was mostly irrelevant on the account of the scarcity of options. But as of version 3, there are plenty of characters to choose from who can all achieve the same end result, even if they go about it in their own unique ways. This was especially true for main damage dealers, who have only one party slot to fight for compared to supports and off-fielders who can afford to share up to three, making things quite competitive. Utal, Ayaka, Shogun, Ganyu, Child, Sino, Wander, Ito, Shao, Yoimiya, Kotsin, Yula, the ultimate win condition for all of them is to deal as much damage as they can in any way they can. So for all hate them to break past most if not all of them and cement himself as one of the best on-field damage dealers in Genshin, he would not only have to excel in one field, but in every field that exists to grade a character. And that's exactly what he did. I talked about this before, but there are two ways a character can be valuable in Genshin, and by extension any video game, to either be the best choice for something, or the only choice for something. Representing the then new Dendro element, I'll hate them had, or rather still has, the best of both worlds. At present, there are 9 playable Dendro characters that we can work with, fleshing out the roster with a healthy balance of damage, support, and off-field pressure. We know that Nahida is far and away the best Dendro character without question, and it's colloquially agreed upon that I'll hate them, at least prior to Farina buffing Baishu to high heaven, is the second best by being both the best and only option in a way. For one, I'll hate them as the best Dendro carry, with his only real competition being Tignati, who evidently struggles to keep up with him outside of extreme circumstances like C6. Technically, his Brogas roommate Kave is also a main damage dealer, but uh, we've established a long time ago that 4 semi DPS units have no hope in competing with 5 stars. So, if you're looking for any on-field Dendro character, I'll hate them is pretty much your only option. Bringing us to the next question, why is this important? Well, because if the entirety of version 3 failed to demonstrate it to you, Dendro is exceedingly overpowered. Being the best and pragmatically only on-field option for the strongest damaging element in the game is quite conducive to one's popularity. 
Now, what makes All Hate Them convincingly the best Dendro unit besides Nahida? It's that he's everything you would want to see on a main damage dealer. For starters, All Hate Them feels very good to play. Historically, there have been a number of units with commendable strength and performance on paper that got diminished in practice, a good example being Klee, whose popularity is hindered by her rather clunky animations and short stature. On the other hand, it could simply just stem from not being everyone's cup of tea, with the bow category being notorious for this, as a lot of players dislike either holding still for aim shots or the fact that their normal attacks can damage only one enemy. In Al Haytham's case, he's of the tall male archetype, giving him the best movement physics in the game. Naturally, with their height, they have the longest stride and therefore initial dash out of any body type, which means they burn less stamina to reposition compared to a short body type like Nahida, who has to expend considerably more stamina to move around, and said movement can feel more arduous on account of their stubbier legs. Furthermore, Al Haytham's a sword use, the best weapon type in terms of attack range and speed, second only to polearms. Though stuff like this is not necessarily present in the front of players' minds, it targets user experience, which is inherently subconscious and not meant to be noticed, yet they still influence the feel of a character. As an on-fielder who intends to spend most of the time on-field, this is one reason why according to most to play all hate them, he feels really good to use. Second reason why he feels really good to play is that his kit is the most conducive when it comes to achieving all your dendro needs, again only behind Nahida. With all Haytham having excellent dendro application and being able to apply it over an extended period of time, he can adroitly accomplish either Hyper Bloom or Quicken rather nicely, which is what distinguishes him from Tignati who for the most part can only perform well in Quicken teams and not so much Hyper Bloom, at least before Farina. The follow-up nature of his Chisel Light Mirrors along with them imbuing his basic attacks with dendro grant him application rivaling even Catalyst users. Additionally, his elemental burst provides a rapid flurry of attacks in a short time frame that instantly maxes out your mirrors, allowing for fast instances of spread. Both the skill and burst contribute to Hyper Bloom and Quicken in their own ways, mainly because both of them set him up to obtain his mirrors, which in turn enable him to apply Dendro fluidly. More importantly, though he doesn't have 100% uptime, he has flexible uptime based on how you rotate his abilities. He can either play Quick Swap and attack really fast, or stay on field for extended periods of time. Each of his Chisel Light Mirrors only lasts 4 seconds, which may seem comparatively short given his burst and skill sharing a rather long 18 second cooldown. However, since he can acquire mirrors through multiple means, he can stay active for longer periods of time than most other on-fielders. Charged and plunging attacks generate mirrors, his skill generates mirrors, and his burst generates mirrors, all together enabling up to 12 seconds of mirror uptime which is more than enough for you to either play Hyper Bloom or Quicken teams, with the remaining downtime being used to cycle through your party members again. Continuing with that train of thought, I'll hate them's comfortable playstyle lends credence to how good he feels to use. He can work with just about everyone that can be used in a Dendro-based team. His basic attack nature makes it easy for him to weaponize Yella and Xingqiu and Beidou's follow-up attacks. His unfixed uptime, whether you want him out for long periods of time or short, can have him work well with units that can do the same, such as Fischl for Quicken or Kokomi and Shogun for Hyper Bloom. And though his mirrors expire upon switching out, with there being multiple ways to acquire them, that means even if you mess up your rotation and forget to use something, you could swap back to a teammate, then swap back to all hate them and continue without missing a beat, whereas other on-fielders like Utao and Shogun lose their damage buff even if they prematurely leave the field, forcing you to either commit to using them suboptimally for the rest of that duration, or swap out and wait the entire cooldown. So he's a character who doesn't actually have 100% uptime in theory, but realistically it almost feels like he does. That's because he has a blanket of Hyper Bloom that strings nicely alongside his personal damage, while other Hyper Carry units don't have that added cushion. Basically, I'll hate them feels like a Hyper Carry in that he has good damage and sustained on-field damage, but he plays like a driver too, so he has the best of both worlds. I guess in a way, it's the same reason why Child has become so good. His own personal damage is impressive, and he can simultaneously augment Chenling's damage. I'll hate them does the same, where he contributes a fair amount of DPS on his own, while at the same time drawing from the strength of Quicken and or Hyper Bloom for big DPS. With those reactions being almost idiot-proof compared to stuff like Swirl which can absorb the wrong element, or Vaporize and Melt which can miss timing, it makes I'll hate them hyper consistent. At the same time, he can also take advantage of personal damage buffs from units like Yelan and Farina, whose total damage amps don't help reaction damage, but since I'll hate them has good personal damage, he can still use those characters. In essence, he can use basically anyone since he can go with any playstyle. If you want to play for reactions and quick swap, he can do that. If you want to do a mixture of both, he can do that. If you want long rotations, he can do that. If you want short rotations, he can do that. I'll hate them can do anything and everything you would need from a Dendro character. He's not locked to a specific playstyle or win condition. This allows him to appeal to a wide demographic. Third reason why he feels so good to play is because he's one of the few characters that you can pull right off the shelf and get going almost immediately. Some characters need specific units to go along with them or have a more elevated investment floor before you can really enjoy them, whether constellations, weapons, or artifacts. But I'll hate them to be used straight out of the box. For one, both his elemental skill and burst have split scaling based on attack and elemental mastery. So like Nahida, I'll hate them internally get stronger by building elemental mastery, dramatically magnifying his strength. 
In addition, one of his passive talents directly converts Elemental Mastery into more base damage for both the skill and burst. It's important to remember that not only does he deal more damage from Elemental Mastery, but Elemental Mastery itself makes reactions deal more damage for even more damage. His EM hyperscaling is not nearly as ridiculous as Nahida's, but it's measurable enough to take into consideration. With this in mind, all Hatham can itemize literally anything. The sword category has an extensive selection of good weapons to choose from, Light of Foliar, his personal of course, there's Freedom Sworn, you can run even Jade Cutter, Mist Splitter, Wolf's Fang, Harbinger of Dawn even. Any of these work for him thanks to benefiting off both DPS stats and reaction stats. Crit, Elemental Mastery, Attack, Energy Recharge, you can throw any weapon you like and any half-decent artifacts without having to malt like you would on someone like Xiao who doesn't want Elemental Mastery whatsoever. Conveniently, you can also farm his entire team's artifacts in one domain. For most of his team's Gilded Dreams and Deep Blue Memories cover about everything. Hypothetically, let's say you have an example team of Alhatham, Shinobu, Yelan, and Nahida. Nahida can run Deep Wood, Alhatham and Shinobu also run Gilded, so 3 out of the 4 party members can farm the exact same artifact only. Besides maybe Neverland, whose entire team can run Marshall Say Hunter and Golden Troop, Alhatham and Raiden National are the only teams where the majority of their units can farm the same artifact domain. You might wonder if something like this has any real bearing on a character's usage, but it does. A big reason why Ito is unpopular despite having a pretty fun playstyle is due to how much work it takes to get him off the ground. You have to get him, then get his personal weapon or Serpent Spine, neither of which you can get if you're free to play, get your Geo units ready which means you have to level up and upgrade entirely new units like Goro who you weren't using until you got Ito, then get specific artifacts that can't really be used by other characters which means you probably have to farm Husk of Opulent Dreams for him and Albedo from scratch. For many, it's simply just not worth the tedium to get going, hence why he's unpopular. Being able to pull out hate them, slap on basically any half-decent sword on him, then grab units like Fischl, Shinsho, Beidou, Kokomi, Shogun who are far more likely to have been used prior to Alhaitem than Goro or Albedo, and get some half-decent artifacts all from the same domain and you're good to go. The only annoying part is that his personal ascension material is one of the more cumbersome ones to get, but everything else is pretty dang good. So let's put things together, Alhaitem is the strongest on-field Dendro carry and frankly the only one. Dendro is a broken element, Alhaitem can exploit Dendro's power in every which way possible making him super consistent and versatile with any Hydro and Electro character in the game. Furthermore, he's extremely easy to get going as he can efficiently use a variety of weapons, both 4 and 5 stars, contributing to his ability to scale off both DPS and reaction stats. Playstyle wise, he appeals to both types of players, the side that wants to run quick swap teams and the side that likes to have one person brute force through everything. He has all of the quality of life features past on-field carries are lacking in some shape or form. But most importantly, what I think helps his case for being one of the most popular characters in the game is that he doesn't have to compete with Nahida. Several times throughout the video, I said that he's the best Dendro character who isn't Nahida, implying that Nahida is the best Dendro character, which is fact. Thing is, Nahida was so far ahead of her time that she was Nivellet and Farina levels of power long before version 4. It's to the point where I might go on record to say she and Farina are the two best characters in the game. That's how overpowered the Dentro Archon is. But try to think of it like this. If Alhatham is Rayquaza, Nahida is Mega Rayquaza. Mega Rayquaza was so insanely overpowered that at one point, he was banned from Ubers, Pokemon's equivalent of the ban list, consisting of Pokemon so strong that they would have a 100% pick rate if they were in competitive tiers. And then you have Mega Rayquaza, who was so broken that he was even banned from Ubers. Where I'm getting at is that Nahida is so far above the competition that it's simply not fair to compare other units to her. That being said, regular Rayquaza still sh**s on everyone, and that's what I'll hate them as. He's one of the best normal characters in the game, literally. He doesn't have Archon privilege, and he's not a centuries old dragon who's basically a god as well. He's just a normal dude, but a really damn good one. In fact, I think he should be the benchmark for the level of quality of life modern on-field carries should have. And besides, I'll hate them and Nahida don't compete with each other. Though Nahida can be used as an on-fielder and honestly prefers to, most people like her for her off-field usability, having someone else on-field for driving purposes. I'll hate them is exclusively on field. This enables the two of them to be fielded together, and they very often are. Essentially, I'll hate them was a beneficiary of circumstance compared to other units who were victims of circumstance. Anything and everything that could go well for him went well for him. He was fortunate that Dendro's reactions were insanely good, fortunate to be one of only two good Dendro attackers while the majority of Dendro consisted of supports and healers, fortunate to not have to compete in the same niche as Nahida, being helped by her presence instead of harmed by her. And to top it off, he had ample on-screen exposure in the Dendro Archon storyline, almost too much in fact. He may have actually had more screen time throughout Samir than even Nahida herself, so when he was finally made playable, you know everyone wanted a piece of him. Exposure, quality of life, and practical strength, the best of every world possible. If Nuvalet, Farina, and Nahida are gods amongst men, Alhatham is a man amongst gods. It's frankly impressive for a main DPS on-field unit like him to have such a widespread player base, beating out even some supports. I guess it pays to be, you know, an impossibly attractive wisecracking cynic. 
But anyways, with there being no signs of any new Dendro characters for quite a while, I think he'll continue to stay as one of the most played characters in Genshin. That concludes why everyone plays I'll Hate Them. Let me know in the comments down below if you agree or disagree with my points, as well as if you think there's anything else I forgot to mention. For now though, if you enjoyed the video, I encourage you to leave a like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Varsven, join my Discord server, and check out my other Why Everyone Plays episodes if you haven't yet. But till next time, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.